Got you. All right. Arthur, Lena, Caroline, Musa, Alec. Okay, perfect. Great, great. Well, okay. Well, first of all, let me welcome everyone today. Uh, what I want to do first is kind of just get some, uh, find out who's on with us today as we go through this new IMBDE. And uh, I see Ahmed, Ahmed is from Phoenix. Okay. All right. And I see Alok, A-L-O-K. Alok is from, um, oh, let me just tell you a few things that you can use, okay? Just in case you need to use them. Uh, at the top of your screen, you should see something that looks like a microphone icon. Do you all see that? Looks like a little microphone. Okay, somebody sees it because I just heard the microphone come on. All right, so what you're going to do is that can actually be used if you have a question for us or anything like that during the uh, during our presentation today. And all you do is just click the little microphone icon. It's going to turn green. It's going to ask you to accept or to allow, and you just click yes. And I want to do a quick check just to see if the microphones are working. Okay. Uh, and if I call your name, just can you turn your microphone on and say hello, uh, Ahmed? Okay, Ahmed. All right, is your microphone working? Yes, I can hear you. Hello? Hello? Yeah, it's good. I can hear you too. Perfect, perfect. And you're calling from, and you're in Phoenix? Sorry. Okay, well, welcome to the group. Okay, in order to mute your microphone, all you would do is just click it once, okay? Okay, got it. All right, thanks a lot. Okay, the next person is, uh, and you can go ahead and mute your microphone, Ahmed. All right, let's go with uh, Alok, A-L-O-K. Okay, not sure if Alok has a microphone. All right, let's go with, Okay, Alec, are you there? Yeah. I think your microphone is on. Perfect. I can hear you. Yeah. Good. Great, great. And where are you calling from? India. India. Okay. Well, welcome to the group. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. All right. You can mute your mic. Okay. Next person is Arthur. Okay. No microphone. I got you, Arthur. All right. All right. And where are you located, Arthur? Russia. Okay, got you. All right, Carolina. Carolina? Hi. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Hi. I'm from Brazil. Okay. Perfect. Great. Great. Welcome to the group. Thank you. All right. The next person is Fatima. All right. Not sure if Fatima has a microphone. Fatima? Okay, Carolina, you can go ahead and mute your mic. Just click your mic once again. It'll turn it off. Yeah, go can ahead you? and just Yeah, just go ahead and turn the microphone off. Just click it once more to turn it off. All right. Okay, how about Joseph? Hello, Joseph? Not sure if Joseph has a microphone. Okay, got you for team. All right. Uh, Juliana. All right, Juliana. Okay, got you for team from Egypt. All right. Uh, Lena. All right, Lena. All right, uh, Maria. All right, I don't know if everybody's microphones are working. All right, Maria. All right, let's go to Monique. Okay, Lena is from Jordan, gotcha, Monique, okay. All right, uh, Musa. Right. Uh, Roman. Hello. Perfect. Okay. Great. Where are you calling from? New York. Yeah, I'm in New York. Okay. All right. All right. I uh, hope you're staying safe. Right. 
<laughs> yeah, thank you. You too. Okay, good, good. Well, thank you. Thank you for joining us today. All right, let's go with uh, Saloni. All right, Saloni's here. All right, Sandra. Juliana's from Brazil, living in Massachusetts. Okay. Hello. All right, Saloni. All right, so Perfect. Yes, I can hear you. Is that Sandra? Yes, I am. I'm from Colombia. Okay, great. Well, welcome. Welcome. Are you, wait, I see, I see two Sandras. Which Sandra are you? Uh, Rada. Uh, okay, perfect. Gotcha. Okay, good. You can mute your mic. Well, awesome. Awesome. Well, I just want to welcome everyone today. My name is Dr. Sutton. Um, I have been teaching uh, the NBDE1 and the pharmacology for NBDE2 since 2008. Um, we have a, as you all know, we are switching over to the INBDE, which is the new exam. Now, just a question, are you all familiar with the INBDE? Is everyone here familiar with the INBDE exam? On like in terms of what they're gonna be, like how it's different from the NBDE? Okay, Joseph says yes, okay. A little bit. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. So one of the things that I'll do is I will kind of give you a little bit about how the new IMBDE is going to be. So um, our group, MDI Prep, we've had a chance to really be involved with the IMBDE. Uh-oh. Wait a minute. Is my voice breaking up? If it is, I need to... Can, is my voice breaking? Okay, Sandra says a little bit. Nope. Okay. All right. So make sure sometimes. Okay. So let's just make sure. Let me just uh, connect it directly to uh, my internet. Hold on one second. Okay. All right. All right. I think somebody's microphone is on. So make sure you have your microphones muted. Okay. All right. Okay, so what we're going to do today, the goal today is to kind of tell you a little bit. Hello? hello sure all right yeah mate hello yeah uh-oh i think i have two things hold on one second okay i think when i tried to switch over because my voice was breaking i think i may have had a, a bad connection uh right now how is my voice coming through it's perfect now Okay, great, great. Okay, good, good. All right, so let's go ahead and mute the microphones and then turn your microphones on if you need to use them, okay? Okay. If you need to ask a question, all right? Okay, first thing is, let me go ahead and share my screen with you. And let's make sure everybody can see that. All right, can everyone see my screen okay? Can everybody see this okay? All right, perfect, perfect, okay, outstanding. All right, so let's kind of go through, I wanna kind of go through and tell you a little bit about this IMBDE. So if you, I, I mean, one thing about the IMBDE is that it's basically gonna take all your years of dental school and put it on one exam. Now that's a lot compared to how it used to be, where you had the NBDE part one, the NBDE part two. Um, so there are some differences in that. Now, the other thing that you're going to have to look at is endurance, right? You're going to have to sit down, you know, for that test. It's going to be about 500 questions. And these 500 questions are going to have similarities to the NBDE1 and NBDE2, but there will be some differences also, okay? Now, one thing for sure, um, 
for those, and I don't know how many of you, I, it looks like a large group uh, are from, uh, have been trained outside the U.S., but they, the, in terms of the level of difficulty for the test, it's not that the test is going to be more difficult. What it is, and for anyone who's taken the NBDE-1, you probably notice like on Facebook, NBDE-1, you have all of these remembered questions and you have all of these uh, test banks and you have all this information to where literally you can almost memorize the information and pass the test. Has, has anyone here taken the NBDE-1 or even prepared for it? Anybody in this group? Okay. Oh, wow, Joseph. That is so, oh my goodness. One point, Joseph. That's close. That is so close. Okay. Yeah, Joseph, you may need to definitely give me a call afterwards. We may need to talk. I may have something. Yeah, we need to talk. All right. So, so let me just tell you about this one. Okay. With the IMBDE, the IMBDE is basically going to take away the memorization part, okay? So it's basically going to remove that ability to memorize questions. They're going to be more critical thinking kind of questions, okay? So that's the uh, the thing with the IMBDE. Hold on one second. Let me try to save this. All right, I want to write on my screen, so give me one second while I can pull that up for you. Okay, I'm going to share something so I can actually write on it. Now, just a question, is anyone in this group actually going to uh, prepare, is any, has anyone prepared for the NBDE-1, the last NBDE-1 in May? Anyone in this group have prepared for that? Okay, all right, I got, okay, you're gonna take it, okay, got you. Okay, all right, so I see we got a few people that are gonna be taking it in May. All right. Right, the key thing is, yeah, that's one of the things that they're looking at is whether or not they're gonna be opening up that exam. Uh, th that is gonna be one of the key things to look at. All right. Okay, so let's take a look at this now. This is coming up. Hopefully it works here. All right, so let's get back here. All right, so what we were talking about in terms of um, what they're gonna do in, in preparation for this test. They're, they're, like we said, they're gonna be removing what we call the memorization part, memorizing information. So it's gonna be a lot more of what we call critical thinking on this exam. And we'll show you some examples of that as we go through uh, what we teach today. The second thing is, is that, um, in terms of how you answer questions, multiple choice questions, right? There's gonna be a way that you can answer these questions and you don't need to know 100% of the information in order to do it, okay? So there's gonna be some test taking strategies that you can use that are really gonna help you answer these questions. Now, the other thing is in terms of how this new NBDE or IMBDE is compared to the old one, so with MBDE1, you had your biochemistry, your physiology, the you know, gross anatomy and all of that. MBDE2, you had the endo, the ortho and everything. What's new though, are things that probably a lot of people have not studied in years, such as biophysics or 
statistics or even evidence-based research, right? How many of you have actually gone through statistics and research in recent years? Is anybody? Oh, good. Okay, perfect. Okay, well, Sandra, that's great. Okay, Lena. Okay, Lena did also. Okay, perfect. Okay, so for some of you, yes, but for a lot of you who maybe have been out of dental school for a while, it may be something that you have not seen in a while, okay? So these are some of the things that they're going to be adding to the new exam, in addition to what you already saw in NBDE1 and NBDE2, okay? So the thing is, you're going to see a lot of NBDE1 and 2 information, but you're going to see some other integrated information. Now, these are the FKs, okay? All right, these are your different FKs. If you've had a chance to go to the website, you've probably seen the different FKs all the way from FK1, which is up here, all the way down to FK10, right? And the way that they're going to approach these questions is, for instance, if you look at FK1 and they talk about biochemical, they can ask you any question from biochemistry. They can ask you about glycogen storage diseases. They can ask you about um, uh, alcaptonuria. So there are a lot of different ways that they can ask those questions. The good news is, is that we are going to approach it in a way that we think they're going to ask you the question based on the workshops that we've been to. Okay. So you don't have to worry about that. So even though they have all of these different foundational knowledge areas, we're going to specifically target the things that they're most likely to ask. All right. Does that make sense to everybody? Everybody got that? All right. Got you, Musa. All right. Just want to make sure. All right. Perfect. All right. So getting right into it, let's jump right into this. OK, so the whole purpose of MDI prep, some of you have may have heard of MDI prep. We've been around since 2008. We've helped over 420 uh, students pass the MBD1 and MBD2. So our teaching method is probably a little different than most. Um, we really, you know, we, we do a lot of interaction, just like we're doing right now. Our teaching is where we're talking, you're asking questions, we're giving answers. That's, it's very interactive, okay? And so let's go ahead and jump right into what we're going to be talking today. And the way we're going to approach the, our IMBDE is each time you have a class, if you decide to join our full class, We'll, we'll start off with a case, okay? So we'll present a case. And what we'll do is from that case, we're going to go through the things that are relevant for the IMBDE. Does that make sense to everyone? Everybody follow me? Okay, perfect. Okay, good. So what we're going to be doing today, I am teaching the first part of this, this test, all right? And then Dr. Young, who's one of the faculty members over at the UT Dental School, Dr. Young will be teaching the second part of this, which is the clinical part. So I will be teaching the basic science part, and Dr. Young will be teaching the clinical part. Okay? Everybody got that? All right, so let's go ahead and take a look at this. And trust me, I'll be asking some questions along the way. So I'll be making sure everybody's awake. So what do we have here? So we have a 66-year-old white Caucasian female, right? And the chief complaint is sore in my mouth, bad taste, my gums bleed every day. All right. Now, the dental history, patient had her teeth cleaned nine months ago. Now, right here in the medical history are things, a lot of the questions that are going to be on the basic science or the FK are going to come from the medical history and the current findings. Okay. Now, if you look at this patient, she has type 2 diabetes, right, hypertension, osteoarthritis, hypothyroidism, rheumatoid arthritis, and she's recovering from a stroke eight months ago. Wow. Ooh. <clears throat> she has a lot going on, right? And so, uh, and so they give her all – now look at all the medications she's on, right? She's on lisinopril, she's on a statin, and she's on all these different medications, all right? And her current findings, basically, there's tenderness in the maxillary left anterior, right? And these are things that Dr. Young are going to go over with you. But for now, let's take a look at the basic science questions that the IMBDE is going to test you on. 
What are they going to be looking at? Okay. So the first thing that we're going to look at is they mentioned that she had arthritis, correct? Everybody follow me? So Monique, all right, Monique, is your microphone on? Yes. I know Monique was there. All right, so Monique, what are the two, whenever you think of arthritis, what are the two most common types of arthritis that you think about? Hello, can you hear me? Uh huh. I can hear you. What are the two? Uh, what are the Correct. That's that's one. And what's another one that's real common? Uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Perfect. Perfect. Exactly. So guess what? It's almost a ninety percent chance if they ask you about arthritis on the IMBDE, it's going to be one of those two types. Okay. Now, question. Do you know the difference between those two? Um, osteoarthritis has something to do with the bone, whereas rheumatoid arthritis uh -huh. has something to do with the joint. Okay, close, close. Okay, you can mute your bike. I like that. That's good. Not too bad. Okay. All right. So that's a great job. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a look. Now, one of the ways that we teach if I love mnemonics, right? Everybody know what a mnemonic is, right? Easy ways to remember information. So anybody who's ever taken our NBDE uh, prep classes, they know that we use a ton of mnemonics. So the first thing is I want to tell you the difference between osteoarthritis and rheumatoid arthritis, okay? So li listen to the mnemonic. <clears throat> Heb, dipped, and bow, pipped. Now they are both worn out. All right, everybody get that? Heb dipped, bow pipped. Now they are both worn out. Okay, so these are the things that you need to know regarding osteoarthritis for the IMBDE. Number one, worn out. So osteoarthritis is typically due to what we call wear and tear. Basically, your bones are tired, right? overuse over the years, you may have been an athlete, it could have been anything, but over the years, your bones have basically worn out. So that's what wear and tear is. Everybody follow me there? Okay, perfect. Now, the O in worn are osteophytes, these bone spurs. So this is really pathognomonic for the osteoarthritis. They'll talk about these different osteophytes, okay? Now, one way you can identify if something is actually osteoarthritis is relaxation, right? If relaxation makes it better, then, and you are in pain. So typically, if you're, if you're using it, you're in pain. But when you're relaxing, it makes it better. That's an indication that it could be osteoarthritis, okay? Treatment, how do we treat it? We use NSAIDs, and we'll talk about NSAIDs in just a second. But we use NSAIDs to treat osteoarthritis. Also, you can use uh, certain glucocorticoids and things like that, but NSAIDs are what we use, okay? Now, one of the things that they'll mention, they'll mention the name Heberden's nose or Bouchard's nose, okay? And basically, if you look at the distal uh, interphalangeal joint or the proximal interphalangeal joints, that's what we call the DIP and the PIP, you'll see these little nodes, these little nodules that are kind of like poking out of those areas. Does everybody follow me there? Good, okay, Monique, yes. All right, Carolina, yes, Joseph, yes. perfect. All right, gotcha, man. So guess what? Those are the things you need to know for osteoarthritis. Now, question, can you teach that to me? If I were to ask you to teach that to me, could you teach it? <laughs> no, you can't. You go, yes, Joseph, you're going to teach it just like just like we just did it, right? Just like that. Just like I taught it to you, you would say, hey, you would say, uh, if you want to know about osteoarthritis, then guess what? We're going to use the mnemonic, hip dipped, bow pipped. Now they're both worn out. So everything that, hey, hey, I understand. Trust me. You know what? 
you and I must be around the same age because I've been out of school a little, just a little longer. But yeah, I understand. But what we do is that's why these mnemonics are going to be so important. Okay. These mnemonics are going to save your life on the exam. All right, everybody follow me there. All right, got it. All right, any questions on that? Any questions? Any questions on osteoarthritis? All right, let's go to the next one. So that's osteoarthritis, right? Well, Monique said, well, we have osteoarthritis and we also have rheumatoid arthritis, right? Well, what is rheumatoid arthritis? How is it different from osteoarthritis? And this is the way I like to remember this. Three women spread the rumor. See, the rheumatoid arthritis is the rumor. Three women spread the rumor. I know, don't blame me for the mnemonic. I know what you're saying with Dr. Sutton. Why couldn't it be three men spread the rumor? But we're just going to say three women spread the rumor, okay? Now, the three represents a type three hypersensitivity reaction, okay? Now, on the INBDE, they will ask you about the different types of hypersensitivity reactions, all right? Do you all know those four types? Do you all know the four types? Uh, yes, no, maybe. Give me a yes or give me a no. Do you all know the four types? Okay, Roma says maybe. Okay, I like no, maybe. Okay, all right. So there's a mnemonic called ACID. A C I D. Okay, ACID. So type one hypersensitivity is what we call anaphylactic. Type two is called cytotoxic. Type three is immune mediated and then type four is delayed hypersensitivity okay so delayed type four is the one that you typically see with like tb you know have you ever gotten a tb test and you go get the tb test and they inject the tuberculin under your skin and then you have to come back later to check it out that is a type four hypersensitivity reactor which we call delayed hypersensitivity okay so these are the four types. Well, with rheumatoid, right? With rheumatoid arthritis, rheumatoid, it's a type three hypersensitivity reaction. That means it's immune mediated. Everybody understand that? Okay, perfect. Now, that's the three. Then we say three women. The W is women are more affected than men, okay? So typically, women are more affected than men. The O, guess what this one is? Overactivity is good. Now, is that different from osteoarthritis? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. That's right. So with rheumatoid arthritis, the more you work, like say you wake up and you typically have what we call morning stiffness, like you're really stiff in the morning. But once you start walking around and moving, it actually goes away. You feel better. So overactivity is good, okay? Uh, rheumatoid arthritis is an autoimmune disorder where basically the antibodies are attacking certain areas, okay? Now, guess what? The treatment is going to be similar to osteoarthritis, which is the NSAIDs, and the synovial joints are what's most likely affected, okay? Now, in rheumatoid arthritis, you do not see rheumatoid arthritis in the distal interphalangeal joints, okay? You don't see them there. All right, everybody follow me there? So is everybody comfortable with the difference between osteos? Oh, I'm sorry, thank you, very good, all right. So NSAIDs are non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, okay? That's like, uh, you've heard of like naproxen or uh, endomethacin, ibuprofen, exactly, that's right. Uh-huh, exactly. You, you follow me, Sandra? 
Yeah, you got it. Perfect. All right. Now, speaking of that, let's go ahead and look at this. So this is FK8, right? Perfect. Okay. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to turn this session over uh, to Dr. Young. Um, he will, Dr. Young will continue with the, uh, the clinical piece of this. And then when Dr. Young, oh, wait, before we do that, let me just kind of point out something. Each one of you, and I think I have everyone's email. Let me just show you all this. Um, each one of you will get a login and password, okay, um, for something called Class Marker. All right, this is our quiz website. And let me just kind of show you what, you, what you're going to be looking at. All right. So you're going to get an email, at, and with that, in that email, it's going to have a login and password. Once you go to that login and password, you're going to go to this one that says INVDE 2020 Sample Questions, okay? When you go to the sample questions and you click Preview, you're going to have 20, you're going to have 20 questions covering the items that we talked about today. Does everybody follow me there? Okay, is everybody with me? Okay, perfect. So just to kind of re recap that. So you're going to go here. You're going to see IMDD 2020 sample class. You're going to hit preview, and it's going to give you 20 minutes to do these 20 questions, okay? And, uh, and you'll see, and I'll just kind of show you what it's going to look like. You're going to see the patient case, like we talked about today. You're going to see some charting and some other things, and then you're going to answer those 20 questions. We're going to get a. We're going to get your score, and you're going to see your score. And then after that, you know, if you have any questions, you can always email us. Does that make sense? All right, perfect. Okay, so I'll turn it over to Dr. Young now. And when Dr. Young is uh, finished. All right, everybody hear me? Outstanding. Welcome, everybody. It's exciting to, uh, to, <laughs> it's exciting to, to uh, meet you guys and uh, looking forward to this new class. Um, we're going to kind of go along with the same theme uh, using that same case study that uh, Dr. Sutton started with. So the same 66-year-old white Caucasian female. Um, and we're going to be talking about this from the dental aspect. Can everybody see my screens? Good. So as Dr. Sutton mentioned, these questions are going to be kind of integrated, right? The questions that you're going to be getting on this on this new format, they're going to be integrated. They're going to include a lot of the fundament, the fundamental knowledge questions, but they're also going to include some clinical content. OK, and there is about 56, um, 56 different areas that they can uh, pull from. Yes, I can make this like it. Is that better? So there are 56 different areas that they can pull from for clinical content. But to make this really simple, this first slide that I'm showing you right now, this is everything that has to do with diagnosis and treatment planning. All right, so about 15 different topics that you can pull from diagnosis and treatment planning. Um, this next uh, slide, these are, this is oral health management. So this is actual clinical application, right? beyond diagnosis and treatment planning. This is the actual clinical application. So this is what you do every day when you see your patients um, and you're performing treatments on your patients. And we have um, 16 through 38 here. These are the, the uh, different clinical content areas. This goes through everything from uh, operative to periodontal to oral surgery, periodontal, um, ortho, uh, how to apply a pharm uh, pharmacological agents through, through the treatment, managing medical complications and emergencies, that sort of stuff. And then the last section is practice and profession. This is everything from um, ethics and professionalism to patient management to uh, insurance, um, OSHA and HIPAA, jurisprudence, all of that is, is in this section here as well, okay? Um, and you don't have to memorize these, this is just to give you kind of an idea of how they're putting together the questions that you would find um, coming uh, that would be more more dental related and less 
um, science related. Okay, now these questions are all going to be integrated, uh, obviously, as Dr. Sutton pointed out as well. Any questions on that so far? Okay, so if we were to break this down into uh, a little a little more detail, um, you'll see that the majority of the questions are going to come from what you can actually do clinical, uh, clinically applied questions. Okay, this is the oral health management, that second section that I showed you. Okay, the first section is going to be the second largest amount, diagnosis and treatment planning, and then the smallest section is going to have to do with practice and professionalism. All right. So um, let's let's go back to this case real quick because I want to show you guys how you should look at these questions, look at this information from the dental aspect. Okay, so we're just going to kind of review this real quick. This case uh, we have the 66 year old white Caucasian female. Um, for us in dentistry, you know the the biggest thing that we need to pay attention to, and I, I talk to my assistants about this every day is we need to make sure that we have this chief complaint in quotations, right? Because this is what the patient is actually telling us. This is this is what we call, is this subjective or objective information? The chief complaint. Would you guys call this subjective or objective information? Right, subjective information, right? It's what they're telling us, how they feel, right? Then we have the dental history. About nine months ago, they, she had her teeth clean. Uh, Dr. Sutton went over her medical history with you. Um, our extra oral examinations, we see nothing that are out of normal limits, so everything's fine. Intraoral, though, we see some tenderness in the maxillary left anterior sextant, right? So that's a bunch of words that basically means the front top teeth on the left seem to have some sort of exudate present or purulence or pus, right? Something is, something is flowing from the gums in that area, okay? Um, extra information, this patient has a sore throat and consistent dry cough. And let's just go ahead and wrap back over to what Dr. Sutton was talking about. Why might this lady have a dry cough? There's a medic. Yeah, there we go. Somebody remembers something. All right, that eighth inhibitor, right? All right. She experienced physical deficits post-stroke and needs personalized oral hygiene recommendation. All right. Um, so serious physical deficits, this is most likely due to what? Good. Most likely due to the stroke, right? These are things that we have to figure out with our patients when we're managing. This is part of patient management, right? We're we have to notice these things. Can they use their hand? Do they have... Uh, interesting gait when they walk. Uh, do they are they able to grip hard when you shake their hand? Are they able to grip hard, or is it a loose grip? Do they have con full control over the movement of their arm? Right. All of these affect whether or not our patient can properly take care of themselves at home. Do they have someone at home helping? These are all good questions, right? So, and then her health behaviors: the patient brushes with the medium toothbrush once daily. She does not floss. She uses an interdental brush where it fits, and she rinses with a phenol mouth rinse daily. She has 65% of her teeth are bleeding. Only 25% of her teeth are free of plaque, and she smokes, okay? Now, I'm not sure if uh, Dr. Sutton had showed you the, the perio charting, but real quick, this is just the, uh, these are the perio charting. Is everybody familiar with charting? Good. So in this pair of chart, we notice that we do have some pretty high numbers here, okay? These high numbers indicate that we have some sort of periodontitis going on. We've got some deep pockets. We see that she has some implant, the IMP that, that stands for implants, that are in the area. She's missing some teeth, okay? She has some mobility present on some teeth. She has some pretty serious pockets present as well. Um, I see some 11s and 12s in there. In the mandible, she's missing the posterior teeth, and those are replaced with implants, but not a whole bunch of, uh, not a lot of pocketing going on with the mandible. Mostly in the maxilla is where we're having our issues. All right, and then just a quick glance at her radiographs. We see that she does have implants. There's a significant amount of bone loss. Um, we see some preapical pathology going on on some of these teeth. She's definitely had some pretty significant dental treatment on every tooth that she has. 
except for the lower anteriors. And here's a clinical view of our teeth. So when you, when you uh, are taking this INDBE, you're going to get a, basically a, a stem that gives you a lot of this information, maybe a little more condensed, but a lot of that information is going to be present to you, including pictures, x-rays, and things like that. Okay, So when you look at that, you have to kind of consider what, what is the information that I should be pulling from this. Okay, Because when, you, when you're approaching these questions, the goal is that you approach these questions in the same way that you would approach a patient that comes into your operatory. Um, in your clinical practice, okay? So obviously, major focus of this question would be perio. Does everybody agree? Good. All right, so um, we all know about the grades of periodontitis. We used to call it healthy gingivitis, mild periodontitis, moderate periodontitis, and severe. And we've moved this over to grades now. So we call it zero, one, two, three, and four. All right, we still usually refer to gingivitis as gingivitis. But when we get to periodontitis, we call it, we can call it grade one, two, or three uh, periodontitis. And we'll break this down more in class. But in general, the information still stays the same. Uh, you can use whatever classifications that you want. But in general, if we have pockets above seven millimeters, we have some serious concerns, right? We're in the four to, four to six millimeters. We need to do some, usually some initial therapy monitor the patient. If we're in the severe periodontitis uh, frame, then we need to do initial therapy and begin surgical therapy, most likely. Does everybody agree with that? Does everybody remember that? Good. Too easy, right? So let's talk about some things that we might have saw on those radiographs, right? So on those radiographs, we did notice that we had a lot of horizontal bone loss, but we also noticed that there were some bony defects. Did anybody see vertical defects? Does everybody remember what a vertical? Yeah, you remember that. Good. Number 11. It's a pretty decent vertical defect right there at number 11. All right. So let's talk about these defects because not everybody may remember them. And there's a few things that are important. Okay. First of all, how we, how we are looking at these teeth. Um, sure. No problem. Um, the way that we're looking at these teeth on these, on these, uh, PAs for this picture in particular is not usually the most helpful way to see the periodontium or the bone supporting the teeth. Okay, the best way to actually look at this is using a bite wing. All right. However, from this, from this, from these PAs, from these X-rays that we see that are PAs, we are getting enough information. There's significant enough bone loss for us to be able to make some diagnoses. Okay, um, bite wings the most important image for you to be able to diagnose any sort of osseous defect, okay? Um, typically what we're looking for when we're looking at these x-rays is periimplantitis. Yes. Um, typically when we're looking at the x-rays, we're looking for the height of the bone from tooth to tooth, okay? And when we have a height of bone that is lost at a normal interval from tooth to tooth, in other words, if, if from the CEJ, which is the neck of the tooth, where the enamel meets the root, if from the CEJ, the distance between there and the bone is consistent from tooth to tooth, then we call that horizontal bone loss. Does that make sense to everybody? Good. However, if when we're looking at these x-rays, let me pull back up this x-ray, and we have bone loss, for instance, between uh, 10 and 11, we see this 10 is the implant, 11, if you're looking at the center x-ray on the bottom, 10 is the implant, 11 is the uh, tooth that has the post in it. We see that there's a vertical defect, an angular bone loss, starting uh, towards the top of the implant and headed towards the apical aspect of tooth number 11. Does everybody see that? So there is bone loss present, but the, the amount of bone loss changes pretty significantly, pretty drastically between these two teeth. This is what we call a vertical bone loss, also called vertical defect. And we also call that an intrabony or intraosseous defect. Okay, these are multiple ways that we can call those. All right. Now, what's pretty tricky about this is 
whether or not, and this is where a lot of people get tripped up, whether or not we classify these appropriately, okay? Now, the easiest way to think about this is if you have all of the walls, all right, then that is a that is the most favorable to regeneration. This is the easiest one to fix. All right. And so I want to I want to put it to you like this. Let's say we have a box. Okay. Let's say I'm gonna draw a picture of a box real quick. Let's say that we have this box. Okay. And the box is open on top. All right. Box is open on top. And we wanted to put some something in the box. Okay. This box would probably hold things. Would you guys agree? Whatever we put in it would stay there. Would you guys agree with that? Good. So if I wanted to drop some balls, let's say. Say I wanted to drop some balls inside this box. The balls would most likely not leave this box if I drop them into the top. Okay, this is a clear box. Now, if I got rid of one of these walls on the box, all of a sudden, it's going to be easier for us to lose these balls. Do you guys agree? And the more walls that I drop for this box, the more the balls are going to spill out. So with that being said, when we're looking at these bony defects, we're looking at these bony defects like they are boxes, okay? And we have different classifications for, excuse me, for these bony defects based on, um, based on how many walls are remaining. So if we have a one wall defect, when we say one wall defect, that is the least amenable to, to regeneration, okay? One wall defect means there's only one wall up. So if we had this box, that means we only left one wall remaining and all of the other walls were down. Would we be able to hold anything in that box? Not at all. Not without doing something special, right? And when we go into class, we would talk more about guided bone and guided tissue regeneration, right? Where we're placing membranes down to help hold up the areas where our bone is missing, right? So that we can trap the bone graft that we're trying to place. Does that make sense? All right, so the two-wall defect is the most common defect that we're going to see. Typically, when we have a vertical defect, it's going to be a two-wall defect. There's going to be some bone loss, usually on the buckle aspect of the tooth, just like this picture that you see, B. Um, there will be some bone loss typically towards the buckle, and it's going to be vertical, vertical coming from an adjacent tooth and going towards the apical region of, of the the actual tooth that is affected. These are the most common. They're not the best to repair, but we can repair these pretty easily because we only have one wall to replace. Does that make sense? So A is a three wall defect. In other words, we have three walls remaining, okay? B is a two wall defect. We have two walls remaining. C in this picture is the one wall defect, the least amenable, the one that's not gonna hold anything in it unless we build some walls there. Does that make sense to everybody? I see typing, but I don't see anything popping up. Okay, cool. All right, so that's something that we saw in the x-rays. Those are things that should catch your eyes as dentists, okay? As, 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 Dental professionals, x-rays are 
pretty much our bread and butter. That's where we see everything that happens in the patient's mouth, including what's going on in the periodontal tube. All right. All right, so as I said, horizontal defect, this is what a horizontal defect looks like if we have all of the teeth. You know, we don't have any, any angular bone loss. We just have a, an even amount of bone loss across uh, the teeth, okay? So that's what a horizontal defect would look like for those of you who wanted to know. Here's a more extreme example of a vertical defect where this would be most likely a one wall defect. They've lost the lingual wall. Um, for this tooth number 14, okay? And so this would be very difficult to repair without uh, usually some sort of a block bone graft, okay? Which we'll talk about when we are in class, we'll talk more about that. All right, and we, we, we just went over those. All right, so now let's talk about why we get these defects, okay? So we know that we have periodontal disease happening, and we know that a lot of times uh, this periodontal disease while, can, while, while it can have some physical components, there are a lot of times a microbiological, microbiological component, okay, component. So in, in the healthiest people, in people who don't have gingivitis, people who don't have bone loss, um, people who, who are brushing their teeth twice a day, flossing and seeing the dentist every six months, these patients tend to have healthy gums, okay, and these healthy gums if we were to sample these gums, we're going to see gram-positive uh, bacteria there, usually streptococca, uh, streptococcus and actinomyces uh, genera. And there's multiple actinomyces um, that are there. All right. Now, in when we start to become less healthy, uh, we get to that first stage in periodontal disease. Okay. So periodontal disease includes gingivitis. All right. Gingivitis is the inflammation that can lead towards periodontitis. But gingivitis is the first step in periodontitis, all right? Now, gingivitis, we're going to start seeing some negative rods, spirochetes, and we're going to start seeing some mo mobile microorganisms, motile. In other words, they're moving around on their own um, microorganisms, all right? And these can spread from tooth to tooth across the gums pretty efficiently, all right? Um, if we were to leave these gram-positive rods here, gingivitis means that we have inflammation of the gums, right? Does everybody agree with that? But does gingivitis mean that we have bone loss? Not necessarily, right? Good. When we have gingivitis that stays too long, then we start getting in effect, we start having an effect on the bone. Okay, and how this happens is those pockets, gingivitis is pocket depths above four millimeters. Does everybody remember that? Good. So when we get pocket depths above four millimeters, then we start developing this, yes, false pockets, pseudo pocketing is what we call it, or false pockets. All right. But we've started to create a habitat for these gram negative. Uh, usually aerobic uh, microorganisms, but the deeper these pockets go, the less oxygen is available in those pockets. And now we start developing these bacteria that are anaerobic. And these anaerobic bacteria, they are uh, the worst, right? They're the worst for the gums because these anaerobic bacteria are what starts to cause this bone loss, all right? And that's when you get the P. gingivalis, the T. forsythia, the P. intermedia, and all of these other bacteria that start causing this inflammation in the bone itself, okay? And that inflammation that is so deep in those pockets beyond five millimeters um, where, we, where we've lost now the oxygen that the bacteria, that the aerobic bacteria need to survive. Now these uh, anaerobic bacteria are thriving and causing havoc in the bone, okay? They're causing inflammation in the bone. And when the bone is inflamed, the bone starts to recede, correct? Everybody's still here. Good. All right. So if we have this, this is for our chronic periodontitis patients, all right? Now, occasionally we have what we call aggressive periodontitis. Now, do you guys remember aggressive periodontitis typically is going to be happening with our juveniles, right? Our adolescents, um, 
typically between 12 and 17 years old, males and females alike. Going to be on molars. Uh, we're going to see this a lot of times around molars, the first molars, or um, uh, anterior teeth. Does everybody remember that? Now we will, we'll go over the trends when we get into the to the major class, but that's going to be aggressive periodontitis. All right, that's usually your AA accommodants. All right, and then we have the necrotizing diseases. We used to call it a nug, but now we just call it nug necrotizing ulcerative gingivitis. All right, these are going to be the the bad actors as well, P. intermediate spirochetes and fusiobacteria. All right, and then we have abscesses, and these are typically well when we go into endo. We'll discuss abscesses, which are typically uh, start off as an endodontic uh, condition, but occasionally have an endoperio um, correlation, all right? And these are the bacteria that are present in there. All right, so if we were to break these bacteria down, like I said, we have our primary aerobic bacteria. Those are the ones that, you know, they're acid-loving. They start cavities. They cause a little bit of gingivitis. Um, those are your primary aerobic bacteria. They sit there at the front, at the top of the gums. When we get to one to two millimeters, uh, transitioning into the three millimeters, we start getting the aerobic and anaerobic bacteria. And then in the beyond three millimeters, we start getting our periogenic bacteria, okay? And these periogenic bacteria, when we start getting to gingivitis and we start getting to periodontal disease, we start moving more towards from these purple, red, sorry, purple, yellow, and green bacterial complexes, we start moving towards these red and orange complexes, okay? Now, on the exam, the most important complex that they want you to know, of course, is going to be which complex? Your red and orange complexes, exactly. Now, really, it's going to be the red, right? P. gingivalis, T. forsythia, and D. T. denticola. All right, they're going to be asking you these questions all the time. All right. The other ones that they want you to know are going to be your purple, the, the ones on the other side of the spectrum, the healthy one. And then they're going to want you to know the, the karyogenic bacteria. All right. But in this case, we're just going to really kind of focus in on this on this red complex here. OK, this red complex is what's going to lead to us having severe periodontitis. If we're not getting rid of these pockets, if we're not getting rid of the ability of these anaerobic bacteria to thrive, then we, we have continued bone loss, okay? And what happens when we have continued bone loss? Good, we lose teeth, right? So I always tell my patients, you know, I don't know if you guys have ever looked at a fence post in the ground. You can't restore the bone. Uh, sometimes you can, but I mean, we, we want to get to, we don't, we don't want to have to restore the bone if we can avoid it, right? So when I talk about bone loss to my patients, this always helps with my students as well. You know, we talk about a post in the ground, okay? Just like a fence post in the ground or a light pole in the ground, whatever you, uh, whatever pole or rod that you stick into the ground, if you stick it into the ground and you stick it in deep and the dirt around it is supporting it, it's not going to move, right? But if I start digging that dirt out, around the fence post, all of a sudden we're gonna start getting movement, right? It might move with the wind, it might move to touch, and then the more it moves, the more of that dirt starts to go away on its own, right? And it starts making the problem worse for itself. So this is the same issue that we have with patients who have periodontal disease. Once we start the process of bone loss, that bone loss can become its own problem uh, if we don't address it, right? If we don't stabilize those teeth, the bone loss will perpetuate upon itself. All right. So this is just going back into those. I, this is just kind of, uh, this is a slide that I usually have in, uh, in the lecture, in our perio lecture. So this is just kind of like a sample of our periodontal lecture. But um, I also break this down into our early colonizers and late colonizers, okay? So the early colonizers, we didn't really talk about the blue complex, but um, the early colonizers are going to be your, your purple, green, and yellows, all right? Blue complex is always there. We'll just say that. Um, and then our late colonizers, these are the ones that come whenever we have those deep pockets, the anaerobic bacteria. That's going to be your orange and your red complex, okay? Now, what actually causes recession, 
Okay, so if we look back at this picture, we looked at the clinical picture of this patient, we noticed that we're starting to see some recession around some of these lower anterior teeth. Does everybody see that? They have some recession, all right? So what causes this recession, all right? So we do get recession from periodontal disease, but this gu these gums here, while they're slightly inflamed, you know, if you remember, if you recall from the periodontal charting, we don't really have, I mean, we have some pocketing with slight gingivitis, but we don't have anything that's a five, right? So something is causing this recession here, right? Does everybody agree? Good. So a lot of times, you know, we have, we have the etiology of recession. A lot of times we always want to get, you know, the history of our patients as far as like how they're taking care of themselves. Obviously we can see if they have braces or if they have something that's on their teeth that's causing um, an area of chronic inflammation. Okay. So recession, you know, kind of let the cat out the bag, but a lot of times it's chronic inflammation, right? We get that, we get that chronic inflammation or chronic trauma and we start having recession in the area. So poor brushing habits, good. Toothbrush abrasion, floss, flossing clefts, right? What is a flossing cleft? Those are patients who are flossing incorrectly, right? Using a sawing motion instead of pulling the floss through the contacts of their teeth, right? Oral habits, patients who chew on pens, patients who chew on toothpicks um, on a regular basis may have an area that has trauma, chronic trauma to the area. Of course, periodontitis will cause recession, all right? That's the inflammation aspect. Morphology, right? Does the patient have a thin or thick biotype? And in our, in our class, we will talk, we'll discuss, you know, the different biotypes of the gingiva. As a quick example, you know, the gums around this picture that we see here, um, the, I don't know if you guys can see my mouse. Can you guys see my mouse? You can? Okay, good. So the, the, the gums around the collars of these teeth that don't have the, the localized recession, okay? These gums, this is a nice, what we call a nice thick biotype, all right? However, right here where this little white arrow is, this is actually a thin biotype, all right? In, we would go into more detail, but basically we have more keratinized tissue in the area around the healthy teeth. We have a loss of keratinized tissue in the area around this unhealthy uh, vertical aspect of recession, okay? Um, with this, you know, we would go into more detail talking about whether or not this is a dehiscence, right? Uh, talking about what this other inflammation is going on around this uh, area of bone loss, okay? I'm gonna tell you flat out, plaque is the reason why we have this inflammation right here. Um, and we usually see plaque-induced gingivitis in patients who are wearing braces. Of course, frenum, uh, as Sandra pointed out, frenum have a lot to do with what type of uh, issues we are having in the adjacent teeth. So you can definitely look to see if you have a high muscle attachment um, in the in the uh, in the gingiva adjacent to the teeth. Okay. Um, ab fractions. All right. If we have ab fractions, these are patients who are grinding on their teeth, right? What's an ab fraction? We've, we've ground on the teeth, we're, we're grinding our teeth, or we're clenching, and we're losing cervical bone, or cervical, excuse me, not bone, cervical uh, tooth structure, all right? Which includes the enamel and the cementum around the roots, all right? What if we have restorations that violate biologic width, right? Anything that's violating our biologic width, which we'll go into in the exam, uh, when we're during the class as well, that bio biologic width is an important number, right? 1 point, 1.98, right? Basically two millimeters that we need to be away from the bone from the cervical aspect of the tooth so that we don't cause inflammation that leads to bone loss, all right? And then traumatic occlusion has a lot to do with it as well. Um, we say here that it has not been shown to cause recession, but when we remove traumatic occlusion, it usually leads to resolution of recession, all right? What about with implants, right? Why do we get recession around implants? Right, so what we call this, we call this peri-implantitis, all right? Um, peri-implantitis, yes, it has everything to do with bacteria, 
but usually caused by something else, right? Bacteria is trapped there because we either have rough, uh, either rough post, right? The, the actual implant that's in the bone or the platform that the implant has available and sticking out of the bone, right? Um, or the abutment is rough or the actual crown that we have placed is rough and able to hold bacteria, trap plaque and hold bacteria, okay? Other things that could be there, we could have, you know, when we submit this implant down onto the abutment, which we'll go over in our implant class, um, we may have some excess cement, if, especially if we cemented it intraorally, right? We may have some excess cement that got there in the periodontium and may have gotten stuck and caused some inflammation, all right? Um, we could have some plaque build up there just because of poor oral hygiene. Biggest thing that I usually see is a broken screw or a loose abutment right? The constant moving of that abutment is basically an invasion of biologic width, right? Um, or poor osseous integration and premature loading. Shape of the crown is a big thing too. Contours, yes. Proper contours of the crown. Absolutely. I don't even have that one on here, but that is a big one, Joseph. Um, so, you know, typically what I'm looking for when I see an implant, I want to know, was this implant plant actually placed successfully, all right? Whether or not we know it's placed successfully, we usually go by the amount of bone loss that we see around the threads of the implant. So if you look at this picture, you see on the left side, we have you know, this healthy bone, right? It's going all the way up to that first thread on the implant. But on the, on the right side uh, of this implant, we lost about three to four threads of bone, okay? Inflammation, this is plaque induced. All right, now we expect to lose about one millimeter of bone on that first year, and that's just from the, the process of healing and placing the crown on the implant. We lose about one millimeter of bone in that first year. And every year after that, it's acceptable, although we don't want to, it's acceptable to have lost about 0 0.02 millimeters every year after that, okay? So very small amount. Now, we've got it down to a science nowadays where any bone loss, we're starting to ask questions. But if it's less than zero, sorry, if it's less than 0 0.02 millimeters after that first year, you know, it's acceptable, all right? Um, I think I'm, I'm, I didn't finish a statement here, but the cause of bone loss in this case is inflammation from the plaque. Now, in that patient that we just reviewed, if we were looking at her, you know, thoroughly, we would, we would note that we may have to do some surgical therapy for this patient, okay? Now, surgical therapy, what are we going to need to do? We're going to need to obviously remove the plaque with some initial periodontal therapy, right? What's the initial periodontal therapy for a patient like this? When, we, when we're talking about diagnosis and treatment planning for periodon, periodontal uh, patients, good. So the first step, obviously, is determining that we do have a periodontal patient, right? A patient that requires some sort of initial therapy. And in this case, we have the luxury of having the probing depths already, right? So the probing depths have indicated that we do have some inflammation around the teeth, right? We, we see lots of fives, right? Do we see some fives, right? Especially in the maxilla, right? We see some fives, some sixes, even some twelves, right? So in this case, this patient does have periodontitis, so we need to do scaling and root plane, right? We call that SRP sometimes. Sometimes you'll see it SRP or SCRP, okay? Um, but yeah, we need to do, and that's called initial therapy, okay? We call that initial therapy. So when we're when we're talking about uh, periodontics, you know, we t we want to discuss. The, the diagnosis and treatment planning phases in, peri in perio, okay? So obviously we need to diagnose the patient, all right? And then when we move from here, we move to what we call initial therapy, all right? Then if we like what we see, we go to maintenance. If we don't like what we see, we do initial therapy again. Or we move to surgical therapy. 
And what is surgical therapy? What would surgical therapy be for periodontics? Right, so we're talking about some sort of, it could be grafting, right? Grafting would probably be the last step, right? Maybe it's just surgical SRP, right? Maybe we flap and clean, right? So surgical SRP, all right? This involves things like a modified Widman flap. So when we get into perio, we definitely will be discussing the different types of flaps that you have to do what you know they're going to want to know that you understand the angles of the flaps the type of instruments you would use things like that so we go into all of that detail but yeah sure first surgical therapy possibly some grafting grafting would include gbr and gtr what's gbr and gtr does anybody know that so gbr is guided, good, guided, Monique, you're, you get the star, right? Guided bone regeneration and GTR is guided tissue regeneration. So remember we talked about the boxes, right? We talked about those boxes missing some walls, right? So if those boxes are missing a wall, this box in particular is missing two walls, right? We need to put, we need to put some bone in here. So we need to guide the bone by placing another wall here right? We need to put a wall up, right? That's the guided bone that's with membrane, right? Or with, it could be with a mesh, it could be with a membrane. And a lot of times we can kill two birds with one stone by doing guided bone and guided tissue. Guided tissue, what this means is we don't want the epithelial cells migrating into our box before our bone heals, right? Which heals first, bone or tissue? Soft tissue. soft tissue, right? So those epithelial cells will migrate into this box and cause us to have what we call fibrous, right? Fibrous bone, all right? So this bone is not going to be as dense as we want it to be. It's going to be weak bone because there's going to be epithelial cells that have grown into the spaces, right? Soft tissue can heal, you know, between seven and 14 days. Bone heals in four to eight months right? So we need those, we need to keep those epithelial cells out of this box. So what we usually will do is place a membrane over the top of the box to prevent those epithelial cells from migrating into it, that which allows us to develop a nice dense bone in the area where we have the defect, right? That's your GBR and GTR. Now, the first step of surgical therapy, though, is actually not any of those. What is the first step? of surgical therapy. What's the first thing we do anytime we're dealing with the patient when we're treatment planning? Uh, debridement would have came from the initial therapy, right? First thing we need to do is determine and remove hopeless teeth, all right? We gotta remove the ones that we can't do anything for. Remove hopeless, we have to decide, you know, we've, we've given this tooth a shot. We tried to do the SRP. The mobility is too great. The bone loss is too significant. The pocket depth is too deep. The patient doesn't want to do grafting. Whatever the, the need is, we have to remove those teeth so that we can have the cleanest slate so that we can get the other ones healthy. Does that make sense? So that's step one. And then this would be step two. And then this would be step three as far as our surgical therapy is concerned. Okay. So that's how we're kind of thinking when we're looking at, at this case here, all right? So objectives of surgical therapy include, you know, obviously elimination of persistent disease sites, all right? This means removal of plaque. If we have plaque subgingival, too deep for our instruments, how deep is too deep for a periodontal instrument, all right? So in our class, we'll go over instruments. We're gonna go over, you know, the different parts of the instrument, but we'll also discuss how deep our instruments can actually clean, right? Clinically, your, your normal run-of-the-mill periodontal instruments that your hygienists are using every day, they can't get any deeper than six millimeters, right? After you get to six millimeters and you start approaching seven, you need to do a flap or you need some more specialized instruments to get deeper, right? Typically, 
what we want to do is do a flap so that we can do your surgical SRP. All right. Pocket reductions, usually we're going to do that with some ginger, with uh, gingivectomies, modified Whitman flaps. Modification and elimination of osseous defects, which is what we just talked about with the grafting. And reduction of tuberosities of the retro, retro molar pad. This is also something we might do in a case like this. All right. Contraindications, though, to periodontal surgeries or surgeries in general include uncontrolled medical conditions, right? This is the big one, All right? Dr. Sutton discussed, you know, whether or not you would get a medical consultation for treatment in a patient who has uncontrolled diabetes, right? So, yeah, you would need that, right? Because as you discussed, you know, if you're giving uh, lidocaine you're gonna, with the epinephrine, you're going to increase their blood sugar, right? If they have hypertension, that epinephrine can put, the, depending on the amount that you're going to give, that epinephrine can actually drive their blood pressure up, right? So this patient, she had a blood pressure. Her diastolic uh, number was 90, right? Are we concerned? Yeah, we're concerned, right? We want this patient to be what I call optimized, right? So we send this patient back to the physician and we say, hey, you know, we're going to be given a pretty significant amount of epinephrine to do the surgical therapy for this patient. We're giving 2% lidocaine with epinephrine. Their blood pressure is 130 over 90. Is this okay? Is this normal for the patient? Or would you like to optimize this patient for treatment? You know, you get some parameters for your, for your dental treatment. Right. I don't like to call it a clearance. I like to call it a consultation, right? Because just like you don't know what the physician is going to do, the physician really doesn't know what you're going to do either. You have to let them know what you plan on doing so that you understand and they understand what the parameters need to be, right? How high should, the, how high should I be concerned with this particular patient? Some patients run 130 over 90. Is this normal for the patient? Is this where you've optimized them already? Right, so we need, to, we need to understand all of that. Now, granted, her heart rate was 94 beats per minute, so she might be a little nervous, right? That happens a lot with our patients. When we, they're in pain, when we get them numb, all of a sudden their blood pressure goes back down to normal. All right. All right, if they have active periodontal disease, in other words, we haven't done initial therapy, then, then we can't do surgical therapy. Right? If they're unwilling, obviously, they don't have the money or they're just not interested in saving their teeth, there's no point in you forcing them to get the periodontal surgery. And of course, if they already have a poor, poor oral hygiene and a high caries rate, then we have not prepared them for the surgical therapy that we need to do. Okay. Bottom line is, if whatever you're going to do is not going to be good for the patient or not going to be successful, then you shouldn't do it. So I say that if it's not going to be good for the patient, right? So if we put them under a procedure and they have one of these uncontrolled medical conditions and these uncontrolled medical conditions exacerbate under whatever we're going to be doing, whether or not, you know, whether it's uh, hypertension, whether they're on a blood thinner and we're, we're reflecting flaps and causing a lot of bleeding, hypertension, and we're raising their blood pressure with the epinephrine that we give in the lidocaine um, or raising their blood sugar right, or even the pain medications that we need to give post-operatively, you know, if this patient has an uncontrolled medical condition, we need to get them optimized so that we can manage them uh, in a safe, in, uh, manage them safely, excuse me, all right. If they have active periodontal disease, then we need to have treated that. We need to have debrided the area, right. We need to have optimized them ourselves to be able to undergo surgical therapy and it be successful. Um, if they are not taking care of their teeth, if they have oral hygiene already, and we haven't taught them proper oral hygiene and monitored them over six months or so to ensure that they're doing it properly, then whatever we do is not going to be successful. Does that make sense? Good. All right. So when we get into the actual process of doing periodontal therapy in this patient, We'll kind of, I mean, there's a lot going on on this slide, but we'll zoom into the bone grafting and the free soft tissue grafts and the reflected flaps, okay? So um, these, in the guided tissue regeneration, excuse me. But these flaps, these, these uh, surgical procedures are, might, be, might be what we would do for a patient like this, okay? When we talk about bone grafting in particular on this patient, um, 
this patient, if we're going to be repairing some of these vertical defects, bone graft is what's going to need to happen, all right? That's how we're going to heal these osseous defects. Okay, and we have some options here. We have an autograft, right? Allograft, xenografts, and alloplast, which are synthetic. Um, and uh, all of these options are helpful uh, for us in, in preserving the bone on this patient or in, in, in causing regeneration of the bone in this patient, okay? But in general, when we have a graft, what does a graft do? What are we, what are we actually causing to happen when we have a graft? A bone graft in particular. Okay, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, we've stopped mobility, but how does the bone graft work? How does, good, we're building new bone, okay? How does it work, though? It's a mesh, great. That's what I was looking for. This is a, a template, right? We, we call it a template, we call it a scaffold, right? But it is a, we're making a template for new bone to grow into, okay? And we have different ways of doing that. Uh, we have, when we're doing, when we're causing bone growth, I'm just sliding down a couple slides. We have osteoconduction, osteoinduction, and osteogenesis, okay? So osteoconduction means that we have a matrix for the bone, for bone growth, okay? Osteoinduction, now everything has a matrix, all right? All three of these are gonna have a matrix. So osteoinduction, we have the matrix for the bone growth, but we also have growth factors that cause these mesenchymal cells to flow into the area in, and differentiate into our osteoblastic and osteoclastic cells that cause more bone growth, okay? So osteoconduction, we have the matrix, the cells kind of make their way in and they grow eventually with the blood, all right? Osteoinduction, we're literally causing these cells, these mesenchymal cells to move into the area. And osteogenesis, this is where we've transplanted the, the actual osteoblast and periosteal cells to produce bone directly, okay? So the difference between osteoinduction and osteogenesis, good, PRP, is, 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 <laughs> exactly. Sandra, you're smart. All right, so the difference between osteoinduction and osteogenesis is that osteoinduction has cells that need to be differentiated. Osteogenesis, the cells have already been differentiated. Okay. And we can do this with what we call vampire or PRP, where we're using the patient's own blood in the sites um, to help us have that osteoinductive uh, factor, right? Uh, osteogenesis, we'd be doing something like an autograph from the patient, all right, where we ground down, repeat. Would you like me to repeat? So, yeah, so I'm, I'm not sure where you would like me to repeat on that, but I'm going to say, I'll say again what I, where I started. Uh, we know what conduction is. Conduction is, you know, you just place down bone. So uh, this bone is just a matrix, all right? These are going to be your synthetic bones. These are going to be your xenografts coming from other species. Okay, we'll, we'll roll back here. These are the ones that, that uh, your xenografts coming from different species, your alloplasts, which are synthetic. Okay. Um, the allografts, though, the allografts are going to be your osteoinductive. Okay. Um, and then the osteogenesis, uh, that's going to be one more. Okay. I hear you. I hear you. What did you say now? You said the difference between conduction and induction? Okay. Conduction is, is when we're using something synthetic or something from another species. Okay, those are going to be your conductive, uh, conductive bone, bone grafts. All right, so let me show you. Uh, I have it here. So allografts, right? These are osteoconductive. All right. Conductive means you just have a matrix for the bone to flow into. So the blood flow, so what we typically do when we do in a bone graft, we cause some blood flow to actually happen and then we place this this bone graft material into the site, 
all right? And it mixes with the, the blood that's flowing into this area, right? So in that blood also is the cell that we would need to start the process of having new bone, all right? And so we're just looking at the, the graft material that we place there to be the matrix or the scaffold for the new bone to grow, right? We've given it a template to grow into, right? That, that's when we have osteoconduction. Osteoinduction means we have, there are some properties that are in the graft that we're placing that are causing cells to migrate into that area, okay? So if we did autografts, that would cause, that would be um, an osteoinductive process, okay? Also, um, if we did, uh, it's not on here, but demineralized bone, uh, mineralized bone, that's gonna be your conductive, Oh, I'm, I'm thinking of osteogenesis. Okay, so if we move on from osteoinductive to osteogenesis, that's when we're using blood. We've spun down, we, we've drawn the blood of the patient, and we've spun this blood down to get their, uh, what we call PRP or PRF, okay? Um, this basically just spinning it down to get the cells that would help us. These cells have osteoblast, periosteal cells. There's also a lot of other inductive and um, cells and, and, and osteoblastic cells present that can start the process of directly producing bone in the site, okay? Uh, it's much better for the patient that way, too. All right, so really, I mean, on the exam, really what you need to know is this. You have, you know, allograft comes from you. I'm sorry, uh, from another person. Autograft comes from you. An isograft would come from your twin. An allograft, uh, sorry, a xenograft would come from another species, all right? Um, and an allograft would come from the same species but a different person. Looks like they put her. Okay, I missed that. All right, so as I was saying, osteoconductive materials include xenografts, alloplasts, allografts. Osteoinductive materials, that includes DFDBA, that's your de uh, freeze-dried demineralized bone aggregate, okay? And this basically, they demineralize the bone so that it, it can have, it, it does have a conductive and an inductive aspect, but um, we, it works by recruiting undifferentiated mesenchymal cells, okay? Um, and so I, I'm talking about these graphs because this is how we're going to fix these, these defects that, these patient, that this patient has, okay, and hopefully save some of these implants that she has, all right? And so I'm just closing that real quick because I want to kind of go back to this, to this uh, case that we have, all right? So when we're looking at this case, you know, we talked, about, we talked about what we saw in the writing, okay? But really what I like to do is I like to go to this periodontal chart because this gives us a lot of information around the teeth that we really can't see. We can't get that three dimension uh, from, the, from the radiographs, okay? So I'm looking at the periodontal charting. As I said, on the maxillary teeth, I see that we do have a lot of uh, bony defects, especially around eight and 11, okay? Uh, eight and 11 both have 11 and 12 millimeter pockets, right? On the lingual and on the buckle, okay? So when I see it on the lingual and I see it on the buckle, okay? Um, that tells me that we have a through and through pocket, okay? So is that we have a, a bone loss on the lingual and on the buckle, or lingual and the facial, if you wanna say it like that, then that means we're missing those two walls, okay? And of course it's a vertical defect, so we're missing an additional wall. So this is most likely a one wall defect. There's only one wall remaining, right? the probability of saving these teeth goes down, right? Our success rate is going to go down if we're trying to do a graph to save those teeth or that implant, okay? Um, when I'm looking at the lower implants, I do see that we do have some mobility in one of those implants. We have some pocket depths that are kind of concerning me uh, close to those implants, but we probably can save everything on the bottom. So my biggest problem is the top, okay? So then we look at these x-rays. Right, looking at the x-rays, I also, I'm looking beyond the, the, the implants and I'm looking at the teeth that we still have, okay? 
there's a lot going on besides the periodontal health of these teeth, right? What are we looking at on these x-rays? What do we see? You have a periapical lesion, good. Number nine, yeah, yeah, number nine has a periapical lesion, I agree, I agree. We have some restorative work that may be, we may have some over contouring, right? Are you guys happy with the contours of the crowns on these teeth? Not really, right? Maybe this has contributed to some of that bone loss, some of that inflammation that we have, right? We have some well-done endodontics. Does that endo look good to everybody? Everybody happy with that endo? Not really, right? Decay under the crown, definitely see that, right? So we want to make sure we're, we're, taking, we're taking a full look at these x-rays so that we can fully diagnose this patient and come up with a good treatment plan for the patient. Of course, you know, beyond the x-rays, we have our clinical view of the patient, which gives us another aspect, right? We definitely see that we have bone loss. We have bone loss going on around the teeth. We see that area kind of between uh, 10 and 11, right? Looks like there's some exudate there. Right, lots of inflammation present in the, in the maxilla, a little bit of inflammation and some bone loss or some recession, excuse me, in the anteriors in the um, mandible. You guys all see that? Good. So this is this is uh, all of these information that is provided to you. All of this stuff is important in diagnosing your treat in, in treatment planning your patient, right? And in the provision of the actual treatment as well. Okay. Any questions? All right, is that it? All right, well, thank you, Dr. Young. All right, did everybody uh, enjoy today? Did everybody learn a lot? All right, Dr. Sutton, how are you? You did. Great, great, great. Uh, Dr. Young, if you could just stop sharing your screen. Can you stop sharing yours? All right. All right. I'm going to share my screen just to kind of give you all some follow-up information. Yeah, let me do that. Okay, let's see. All right. Can everybody see my screen okay? Can everybody see this? All right, perfect. Okay, so just so today, basically, what we did was we kind of gave you an overview of how our classes are taught. Um, this INBDE is going to be extensive. You're going to need help with this exam. It's not something that you're going to just learn in two months or something like that. It's it's taking everything that you've done in dental school. So with NBDE one, you could have learned that in say two or three months. MBDE2 could have been another two or three months. So you're looking really honestly to be totally prepared at least four or five months of intense studying, going through cases, going through things, understanding the basic science. And the good news is, is that uh, instructors like Dr. Young, myself, and the other instructors that we have, we can help you through this. Now, uh, just to kind of let you know, uh, for those who have never heard about uh, who haven't had the chance of being in one of our classes before. Um, if, if the classes...